Okay. Are you ready to start? Okay, that's good. So today we're going to talk about uh, chapter 3 with the title Game Theory and Coaching and uh, we will start by looking at um, the penalty kick. Before we do that, uh, just uh, a quick look at um, the progress. Now this is uh, this week. Hopefully we are kind of finished with the lect real re lecturing uh, by the end of next week. Um, and then these uh, 17th and 18th as well as 24th and 25th are kind of put up as lecture dates. There will be a guest lecture on the 25th, I think. Sondre Koffer will, will uh, talk about the long life of strategy and tactics. Um, hopefully interesting for you. And uh, the remaining uh, lectures will be used for um, running through previous exam. So that's kind of the plan for now. It could be that uh, we are not completely finished by the 11th, so we may spend a little bit of time on the 17th to kind of finish up everything, but uh, that is kind of the plan uh, I see for now. And do you know the exam date? Second of December? Should we check out? That's uh, that's possible to find here, isn't it? On the home page? Mm, let me go here. Mm, here there should be some exams. Here there should be some exams. Um, Hopefully it would be sometime in December. It seems to be here. The second. You were right, Tina. The second of December is the exam. So roughly we will kind of finish up um, way ahead of that date. But as uh, I said, uh, the it's kind of put up here until the, the 25th for the last lecture. And uh, then there will be a guest lecture by Sondre Kofur and uh, I assume we, we are kind of finishing up on the 18th, more or less. So then it should be two weeks until the exam, so you have plenty of time of uh, preparing if you need that. Okay, let's move back to the penalty kick. Uh, we discussed this briefly last time. Uh, that it's perhaps the simplest kind of game we can look at when it comes to football. Uh, it's uh, Reasonable to assume two players. It's um, even though it may be a complex strategy space, we talked about all the ways you can shoot a penalty and all the ways, all the kind of strategies a keeper can. We can kind of hopefully simplify it in a manner that makes our results interesting as well as useful. And it turns out that uh, that is the case. And uh, According to the old rules, and maybe even according to the new rules, it seems reasonable to, to use a simultaneous game approach to, to model a penalty kick. And, uh, but be aware of that, that of course this, this new rule sets, which opens up for movement of the keeper before the shot is made, um, kind of opens up for some kind of sequentiality here, which ideally, or should we say in a perfect world, would call for a much more complex game model than the one we will look at here. So we kind of um, try to make it simple and see how it leads. Okay. So let's look at our game model here. <coughs> yes. Penalty kick game. We assume two players. And we name these players Executor, which of course is the player who takes the penalty. And we use the abbreviation E for this character. And the second player is the Keeper. 
or the goalie, or whatever you like to call him, and we use the abbreviation K for the keeper. So that is kind of the first step here. We, we kind of don't believe or like to use the referee, for instance, as a third player here. So uh, we skip that, okay, to, to make it easy. And the second point here is that we assume a simultaneous game. And as we have discussed, this is perhaps not in complete accordance with reality, but it's still kind of it's possible to argue for it, even given the new rules. Especially if there is a penalty kick shootout, and at in a game which matters. Now the more dramatic the game is, the, the closer I assume we get to the kind of model we, we eventually will present. And then let's move to point three, the strategy space. Now, as we discussed previously, of course, there is basically an infinite amount of possible ways to take a penalty kick for the executor. Okay, you can shoot with different force in different feet, different techniques inner side, wrist, outside, and so on. Okay, so uh, of course the, the, the directions could be varied continuously uh, in this given goal and uh, as a consequence there is a huge amount of possible strategies when it comes to how to actually do it. But um, it turns out uh, that it could be greatly simplified. Okay, greatly. Simplified. And the classical simplification involves three options. Either to shoot wide right, shoot wide left, or shoot in the middle. In this model, we simplify even more. Okay? So we assume here that there is only two possible strategies. Either to shoot shoot wide or to shoot in the middle of the goal. Okay, so if this is the goal, there are two options here. Either we aim the shot in the middle or we aim it to the side, one side or the other side. But we don't kind of distinguish between the two different sides here, okay, to make it simple. Okay, so there are three first kind of building blocks for the model. Then let's move to number four, and in number four we make an extremely simplifying assumption. We assume that the executor always hits the goal. Of course this is far from reality. I assume many of us have seen penalty kicks that didn't hit the goal. Uh, Molde had one not many weeks ago against Haugesund, wasn't it? This young character, Erik Hesta. He was taking the penalty and it kind of went over the post. So that happens. But um, again, when we do game theory, what we very often do is that we try to simplify as much as possible first. And then we can afterwards extend the model, changing some of these assumptions. And we will do that in this case. And this assumption is an assumption we will change at the next level. Okay. Then we have to say something about what will happen given various strategic choices of the two players. Okay. So in five, we think about what happens if both choose the M strategy. Okay, the M strategy is defined here. 
I didn't say that. We call this W and this M to keep track on what it means. So if both chooses the M strategy, what that means, of course, is that the keeper, he does not move to any side, he stays, okay? And the executor, he shoots in the middle, okay? So then the question is, what happens then? Of course, in most of those cases, the keeper will save the shot, okay? If he stands still. But still, of course, there could be options that the ball may go through here or on top of the head if you shoot hard enough, but that is something we do not take into account here. So we assume here, if this is the case, then the shot is saved. And if you like, again, a big simplification. Again, if we like to see the effect of kind of opening up for that some shots are being saved in this situation, or actually some shots are going into the goal, we can change that later on. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Then, of course, the next point should be six. Okay, now we look at combinations M, W. This one means that the executor aims in the middle while the keeper goes to any of the sides. And the other option, W, M. The opposite situation, now the executor shoots at one of the sides while the keeper stands. In this situation, of course, what could happen in reality is that the ball doesn't hit the goal. In that case, there is not a goal. But we have ruled that out already, haven't we? By four. So that's not the problem here. The other option here is that the keeper may save with his feet. Okay? You shoot in the middle, the keeper goes, but the ball hits the feet. Okay? But we rule that one out as well. In this case, when there is shot wide, and the keeper stays, and this one is given, then it's reasonable that there is a goal, isn't it? Yeah. So, to sum up, this leads into a certain goal, if you like. Again, of course, we can kind of put something into this that makes it closer to reality, but it, it doesn't really make much difference. Then, there is a final option opportunity here if they both choose the W strategy. And in that case, we assume that some of the shots are saved by the keeper. Okay? A certain proportion, a certain percentage if you like, and we could then model that as a probability. Okay? So in this case, there are some saves, not all, Actually, it shouldn't be too many, should it? because there are kind of obviously two options here. Either the keeper goes to the wrong side and the shooter to the right side for him, and then, of course, there will be a goal. But in this final case where they kind of meet, the keeper goes in the same direction as the shot is aimed, then uh, there may be some saves. But not all of those shots are saved either, okay? So we would expect the probability at least perhaps not much bigger than a, a quarter or something, okay? But we will return to that. So we kind of introduce something here, the probability O a goal in this case, and we name that small p. So this is kind of the share of the situations where both players choose this strategy WW that ends in a goal. And that is something we really don't know, is it? But uh, it should be some share or some part of all the shots which are aimed. And finally, we have to say something about payoff. So far, we haven't said anything about that. Okay. And the simplest way of doing that is as follows. We can make a small table here. If this is the executor's payoff, and if there is a goal, the executor is happy, isn't it? So he should get something, let's say one. The keeper is unhappy, 
So let's give him zero. Okay. The keeper has reversed preferences because he doesn't like it if it's a goal, so he gets zero then. But in that case where there is a save, ah, sorry. Not keeper. This should be not goal. Okay. So if the keeper puts picks the ball out of the net, of course he's not happy. On the other hand, if it's if he saves it, then he is happy. Uh, this is an interesting point, okay, because a lot of experts uh, say that it's more valuable for a keeper to save a penalty than for an executor to get a goal. Do you agree in that, Kano? It's kind of easier to get the goal than to save it. And in that sense, you would expect that the goalkeeper is more happy for each shot he saves than the executor for each shot he puts into the net. It turns out that that doesn't matter. So we could kind of think about increasing this one here, okay? Putting it into two or three or something to kind of denote the difference between the, uh, so in a sense, the utility for each of the two players. But it turns out that it doesn't really matter. And it's possible to prove that. So that kind of argument makes no difference when it comes to the Nash equilibrium of the game. And that's what interests us in game theory. Uh, I will show you a link to that later on. OK, now I think we more or less have our whole model here. Uh, there is an assumption in the textbook here that every player, every player knows one up to eight. So all this information here must be available to both players. If one of them do not have this information, or if they cannot disagree about how to do this, then, then of course the result makes no sense. So this is a kind of basic assumption in these type of games we look at here, which are often referred to as complete information games. If there are asymmetry here, so that kind of one of the players knows more about something than the other, then we move into something called incomplete information games, which are much harder to analyze. Okay, so we kind of avoid that challenge in this course. If you find game theory interesting, at a later stage, I'm certain that you will meet those kind of games if you study game theory more extensively at a slightly more advanced level. But uh, they propose some difficulties which um, we do not want to look at here. Typically this would be at the PhD level, okay? not even at the master level. And we, are, we are still at the bachelor level, aren't we? Yeah. So we can't uh, spend our, bar bar our bow too, too hard. Is that an English term? At least it's a Norwegian term. Okay. okay, now the next step now is to construct the resulting table of information. So let's uh, try to do that. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take it on the board here, because now we have all the information here. So let's uh, just take it up. And it turns out that it looks like this. Okay. Now let's look here. The first line should be easy. Okay. The first line here, here is the executor. He shoots in the middle. In that case, based on our assumptions, if the keeper stands, then there is no goal. Okay, and the utility for each of them is, is um, the bottom line here, isn't it? Zero to the keeper. Oh. No, it's, we have to see the column here, don't we? Zero to the keeper, one to the executor. That's what we put in this one. If we move into this square, the opposite happens, of course. You know, the executor aims in the middle, the keeper stays, uh, moves wide, and then there is a goal. So then the executor is happy, getting a 1, while the keeper is unhappy, getting a 0. In this case, 
the executor aims wide, the keeper stands, then there is a certain goal, the, the executor is happy, getting a 1, while the keeper is unhappy, getting a 0. These are straightforward logic based on the assumptions here. Okay, these assumptions make it possible for us to put values into this table. So, what about this final one here? This is the tricky part, or maybe not that tricky, because in this situation we don't know the outcome, do we? There is a certain probability, P, that there is a goal in this situation. And of course then there is another probability that there is not a goal. What kind of value do, do that probability have? The probability of no goal. There are only two options here. Either there is a goal or there is not a goal. Probability adds up to 1. So this probability must be 1 minus this one. Okay. Because 1 minus p plus p is 1. Probabilities always add up to 1. Don't forget that. So we have both probabilities here. And then we have to return to what we did when we looked at these mixed strategies. Because then, in order to compute the payoff, we chose to find the expected payoff. As long as we have probabilities and values, we can convert this multidimensional structure into a single number, which we refer to as the expected value. And that's the technique, of course, we will use here as well. So, in this final column here, if we look at the executor first now, E, either there is a goal, there is a goal with the probability of P. In that case, he gets a utility of 1 being the executor, because he is happy. Or there could be no goal. In that case, the probability is 1 minus P, as it says here, but that has to be multiplied with the utility or the payoff which the executor gets in that case, which is 0. So this ends up being P plus 0, which is P. Okay. For the keeper, the other way around, isn't it? If there is a goal, the probability P, he's unhappy. If there is no goal, he's happy. That has a prob probability of 1 minus P, but now we have to substitute the 0 with a 1. So this is 0, 1 minus P times 1 is 1 minus P. So this explains the symbols in this small square. Okay, so it's all logic log logically based on our assumptions. So we kind of design our game model by all these numbers. And then, given those decisions we make there, the game, num the game model is given. Okay, it kind of produces a logical game model. Okay, now we have the table. Now we can continue routinely by looking for best replies and Nash equilibrium. Okay? So let's do that. So the, the hard part is really the first part here. Okay, the second part is kind of more or less routine. As long as you know how to do it, then it should not impose too much of a challenge. So the difficulty is kind of making the right decisions about the model itself. Okay. This figure have already done this for us, haven't it? It contains both circles and small circles and small squares. So uh, it seems to be the fact that one is bigger than zero. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? So then we get a circle here. Now let's skip these P comparisons for the moment, okay? And look at this one. This is straightforward. One is bigger than zero. So this square and this circle is straightforward. It's kind of obvious, okay? So the question is, how do we arrive at this circle and this square? In this case, we compare P to 1. Okay. 
So according to what it seems on the result here, 1 should be bigger than p, or p should be less than 1. Okay. So let's look at this p less than 1. p is a probability, so it can never be larger than 1. The only remaining option which kind of kills this argument is if p equals 1. Okay. What does it mean if p equals 1? If p equals 1, the keeper saves no shots. Okay? Then there's everything goes in, and that is kind of silly, isn't it? Then we really don't have any penalty kick left. Then it's something else. It's shooting at an empty goal, more or less. Okay? That doesn't make sense. So it's reasonable to assume that p is less than 1. This is kind of an obvious assumption. We could have made this assumption as a separate number before we start. In that case, we didn't have to make this argument. But uh, the result, of course, is that we get a circle around this p here. It seems as, as well as 1 minus p is bigger than 0. Let's just write that down. 1 minus p bigger than 0. Of course, we can handle inequality by moving things freely from each side or this side to another side. But we have to be remember to change the sign. Okay? Just like we handle equations. We haven't talked so much about this, but presumably you should know how to handle equations. Okay? And you should know that it's allowed to move from one side of the equality sign to another as long as you change the sign. So if you have this equation here, you can solve it easily by moving that to the right hand side and changing the sign. So it's plus one. Of course, that is the solution to this equation. Furthermore, you should know that if you have 2x equal to 8, you can multiply or divide with the same number on each side of this equation. And if you multiply here by a half, you get a half times 2 times x equals 8 times a half. And then you can reduce here and get the solution, 8 over 2, which is 4. <coughs> the same kind of operations can be done on inequalities. But there is one thing you need to remember, that if you multiply or divide an inequality with a negative number, then you have to reverse the inequality sign. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? 4 is bigger than 3. We agree on that, don't we? Now let's multiply by minus 1 on each side here. In that case, we get minus 4 there, we get minus 3 there, and you see immediately that minus 4 is smaller than minus 3 because we move down. So we have to reverse the sign. Apart from that, we treat inequalities exactly the same way as we treat equations. Uh, have you ever learned this? Not, uh, inequalities. Not inequalities. Okay, but now you learn it. And it's quite logical. Okay, so the only thing you have to remember when you handle inequalities, if that is something you are given in this course, you do it exactly as you do equations, but if you multiply or divide by a negative number, reverse the inequality sign. Okay, so we can use the same technique here, and he in this case it's easy, you just move p on the right hand side, then we get, change the sign, p less than 1, which is the same as we already have, isn't it? Obviously, we have explained that the square must be here, and not there. So, what do we see now? We see here that there is no Nash equilibria in pure strategies. None of these four small squares has both a circle and a square inside them. So there is no Nash equilibria in pure strategies, which is of course what we should expect, isn't it? The only way an executor can be certain that the keeper cannot guess on how his strategies are performed is to do that unpredictably or randomly use a mixed strategy. The same holds for the keeper. 
to avoid that the executor guesses how the keeper behaves. The only thing the keeper can do is again to behave unpredictably or randomly or using a mixed strategy. So we should expect these results here. By logic, if we think about how we model the penalty kick here, it's a simultaneous game, then of course you have to make up your mind on what to do for each of the two players. And the only fallback in this type of game is if you kind of act predictably. So if the goalkeeper can guess that I will shoot to the left, that gives him an advantage. Okay. So I have to avoid that he gets that advantage. The only way I can do that is to do it randomly. So what does this kind of thing tell us about the real penalty kick? In reality, nothing, because this model is too far from reality. Okay? Th there is a lot of extreme simplifications here. But I can tell you that uh, if you kind of resolve or take away these simplifications, this result seems to be fairly stable. So even in a real-time situation, it's hard to argue that you should not use a mixed strategy when you take penalty kicks in football, especially if it's an important penalty kick in a big tournament match, or a qualification match or whatever, then uh, this seems to be how both executor and keeper should behave. Of course, then the next question is, do football players behave like that? Do they randomize? And if they do it, how do they do it? The way you should do it, of course, is to kind of analyze every penalty kick situation you, you are kind of foreseeing to come into, and then find the correct probabilities for the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. And then, after finding this, you should kind of either use a random generator or whatever to kind of produce the actual outcomes on a long string. You should put that in your head and have it for you if the situation emerges that it should be a penalty. I don't believe many players do that. On the other hand, what we have seen by some other researchers in this field, when they, they actually test this by looking at the behavior related to penalty kicks, is it that it seems as if observed penalty kicks correspond very nicely with the appli application of mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium. So you, you cannot see patterns in how at least good executors and good keepers behave. Okay. There is not a kind of two left and one right and that kind of thing. Okay. That's not possible to observe. So at least from an empirical point of view, from a view where we observe what really happens, this seems reasonable. On the other hand, we probably all know uh, at least those of us who have done this has, have been football players that we didn't actually apply this theory before we went up to the 11 meters, did we? At least at some point, of course, when you start getting to know football and you have taken a certain amount of penalty kicks, you start thinking like this, don't you? That uh, I must try to avoid that the keeper guesses where I shoot. And of course, if you're a reasonable intelligent person, you would probably kind of arrive at this conclusion, shouldn't you? I, I must try to do this unpredictably. And then, of course, the next step is doesn't really perhaps matter whether you, you get the right probability, but as, as long as you use the probability, then it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, to guess, or actually impossible to guess. So that is kind of where this type of research is at the moment. This is fairly new stuff, okay? It um, came up uh, in the late 80s, 90s maybe, even in the 2000s, so it's um, relatively new. Okay, let me write down the actual answer here. We don't spend time, um, as we already have said, on teaching you how to find it, because then we have to do some little bit more complex calculations here. So it turns out here that uh, the actual Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies uh, looks as follows. And E equals, and then uh, let me just write it up, it looks like this, 1 minus P over 2 minus P. This is for the executor choosing the M strategy. So this is the probability 
that the exec should, executor should shoot in the middle of the goal. And then there is another one, p minus 1 over p minus 2, which is the same strategic choice for the keeper. Uh, let's take a moment looking at these uh, fractions here. If you see this one, p minus 1 over p minus 2, we can simply multiply by minus 1 on top here, and then we get minus p plus 1, and then we get minus p plus 2, which of course is the same as 1 minus p over 2 minus p, which is turns out that these two are equal. Okay. So in this simple model, each of the players in the game, they randomize with the kind of same mixed strategy equilibrium. The previous example we looked at on this one finger or two finger game, we also got that one, but uh, then the probability was a half. In this case it's not necessarily a half, because the probability depends on the value of this small p. To some extent we can uh, make an argument to test our model slightly. Okay. Now you remember, I started talking about this previously. Okay. If uh, we look at this, this p is the probability of a goal in this w w situation. Okay. And if you think about the goal again, if you shoot wide and the keeper kind of moves, how would that look? Yeah, something like this, either in that direction or in the other direction. Roughly, if you think very easy on this, you would expect that in half of these times, the keeper goes to the wrong side. Okay. So the shot is aimed the other. So 50% of the cases, it should be a goal. Do you agree? Because the keeper cannot guess in what direction the shot comes. In the remaining 50% here, there may be some saves. Okay. If there is an extremely good goalkeeper, there may be more than half of this that may be a save. On the other hand, if there is an extremely good executor who is able to shoot hard enough, it may be less than 50% saves. So if we assume that it's kind of an equally good goalkeeper as an equally good executor, we would expect that half of these situations where the keeper goes in the same direction as the shot, there would be saves. The other half, there would be no saves. So goal in this situation would then be 25%. Okay, 50% here, half of this would be 25%. As a total, you would expect 75% goals then in this situation, meaning that P could be something like 0 0.75. Okay, that's a very simple argument to try to find the value for this P and then we can put that into the Nash equilibrium and see what kind of result we get. Okay, that's the point of doing this. Okay. 1 minus 0 0.75 over 2 minus 0 0.75. That is 0 0.25 over 1.25, isn't it? If you subtract on the top and the bottom of this fraction, this turns out to be around 0 0.2. Not, not even around. I think it's exactly 0 0.2, isn't it? Uh, we can test that. We have a calculator here, don't we? Let's see. <coughs> calculator. 0 0.25 divided by 1.25. That equals... Yeah, it was exactly 0 0.2. So what does this mean? It means that given our assumption here on the probability of a goal in this wide wide situation, our model tells us that 20% of penalty kicks should be aimed in the middle. Remember, oh, did I take this? This one is executing choosing the middle strategy. So 20% in the middle, then of course the rest, 80% must be taken wide. This is easy to, to check out, isn't it? We can just observe a lot of penalty kicks and see if in reality around 20% are shooting in the middle and 80% wide. It turns out that that is the case actually. It varies a little bit between countries, between leagues and so on. Sometimes it's 16%, sometimes it's 25 But it kind of 
lies around 20%, lies around 80% for these two strategies. This is uh, nice, of course. You can kind of make a model. You can make an easy logical argument to produce this p equal to 0 0.75. You put that into your model, then it gets something out which you actually can test. You can observe in reality. And it's, of course, always nice if your model kind of corresponds with reality. It does in this case, OK? Again, I will point out some more complex work later on for you here, if you're interested in really studying this stuff. OK. Questions? Now, this is your first example, actually, on how we can apply game theory to gain knowledge about football. Okay. We learn a lot here. We learn actually how should penalty kicks be taken, both from the executor as well as the keeper's point of view, given that we believe in this model. We also kind of see that we can use the model to construct testable hypotheses, okay, because that's what we do here. Now we define, OK, the model tells us that 20% of penalty kicks should be aimed in the middle. Now if you have a lot of football matches on tape, you can go home now. Okay, and if you look at the penalty shootouts, you can just count up, okay, how many goes in the middle, how many goes at each side. But there is a few elements here that, that actually does affect this, and we will see more on this in the next hour. So now there's time for a, for a 15 minute break, okay.